Let's talk about some physical aspects of X-rays and diffraction, just to refresh the memory. X-rays obviously are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They are shorter wavelength than visual and UV light. And by definition, we call the, the range from 0 0.01 to 10 nanometers X-rays, or in terms of energy, that would be 100 electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts. That's the range we define as X-rays. Um, sometimes the, the distinction to gamma rays, which are even lower wavelength radiation, is not so clear. Sometimes they call X-rays up to one mega electron volt, but that's just a common definition of X-rays. And this is important. Um, X-ray diffraction is an interference phenomenon. We will learn that in a minute. It's uh, interference of, of X-rays and um, the interact atomic distances in crystalline structures are in the same range of the wavelength typically. So typically between 0 0.15 and 0 0.4 nanometers. And this is important uh, to generate interference. The, the phenomenon that generates the interference must be roughly in the same range as the wavelength. Otherwise we would not get a distinct interference pattern. So we cannot do X-ray diffraction or diffraction with, for example, visible light because the wavelength is much longer than, than the interatomic distances. So we would not get a nice diffraction pattern. That is the reason why we use X-rays for, for XRD. So how can we generate X-rays? We use a cathode ray tube for that. And you can see a schematic of such a tube here on the left and on the right hand side, a picture of a real tube. And it consists of a vacuum chamber and on one end, there's a filament, usually made of tungsten. And on the other end, there's a target. It's a little metal plate, typically made of copper, molybdenum, iron, cobalt, chromium, silver, any, any pure metal. It's important that it's a pure metal. And first of all, we heat up the filament with a filament current. And then we apply an acceleration voltage between the filament and the target. And this will lead to an electron beam going from the filament to the target. And the electrons are accelerated by the acceleration voltage and they collide with the target. And this is where the X-rays are generated. And this setup is, is very similar to an old TV or computer screen. So the big CRT screens, cathode ray tube screens. And they also use an electron beam that scans the, the screen. And in fact, uh, when computer workplaces were introduced some decades ago, and we all had a big CRT screen in front of us all day, exposure to X-rays was actually a concern. So the X-rays were generated by the electron beam colliding with the screen, and we wanted to, th them to be well shielded, to be protected, especially when we spend hours in front of the screen. So the people who are my age or older, they know what I'm talking about, but maybe the younger people not so much. Um, so here, obviously, we want the X-rays to leave the, the tube. And that is why we, uh, they, uh, there's a window here made of beryllium, pure beryllium, because it hardly absorb, absorbs any radiation. So we get a good intensity. That's the beryllium window over here. Beryllium is highly toxic, so if you ever see a tube lying around in the lab, don't touch the windows. The, the tube should be protected, there should be a plastic cover as soon as you replace them, but uh, don't touch the windows, it's toxic. So what, what exactly happens when the electrons collide with the target material? The electrons, they come at high speed, and they will fly through the electrostatic field of the atomic nucleus of the copper or iron atoms of the target material. And they will interact with the electrostatic field and they will be deflected and slowed down. And whenever an electron is forced to change its direction, it will emit the difference in energy. So when it's slowed down and changes direction, it will lose energy and it will emit this lost energy as an X-ray flash. So this is exactly what happens here. When it changes direction, it emits X-rays of a rather unspecific wavelength, it, because it depends on how close by it passes the nucleus. So sometimes it's slowed down a lot, 
sometimes just a little bit, and the wavelength of the emitted radiation depends on how, how much the electron is slowed down. We call this radiation Bremsstrahlung, also in English, often the German term is still used. It means deceleration radiation, obviously. And um, the spectrum we get from this Bremsstrahlung is a continuous spectrum, because there's no distinct wavelength predominant. It has an upper limit, because the electrons cannot release more energy than their full kinetic energy. So if they make a full stop, that's the maximum energy they can release. So th this depends on, on the acceleration we apply to the electrons, but below that, for the longer wavelength or the lower energy, it's a continuous spectrum. So if we increase the acceleration voltage, we can shift this uh, upper limit a little bit towards lower wavelength or higher energy, or that's, that's the only control we have over this Bremsstrahlung. But sometimes the approaching electrons collide with electrons of the target material, and if the energy transfer is high enough, this target electron can be ejected from its orbital. So now we have a vacancy on a lower shelf, in this example on the K shell, and this is an, an um, energetically uh, un unfavorable condition. So what happens next is that one of the outer electrons from an outer shell falls back to this K shell to fill up the, the vacancy. And this is more, a more stable condition. And it loses potential energy by doing that. And again, the loss of potential energy is emitted as an X-ray flash. And since the, the potential energies of these orbitals are very well defined for each element, so the K shell, the L, different L subshells, the M shells, they have very well defined energies, energy levels. Um, when one of these electrons jumps from one shell to the other, it, it releases a very well defined uh, amount of energy. In other words, a very well defined uh, wavelength of, of an X-ray flash. Here we see for, for, for a copper ion, the innermost shell is the K shell, and the L shell, the M shells. And uh, we call, so we, we use a, a system to label these uh, transitions. Uh, the, the first letter is always the, the target shell. So when something falls back to the K shell, we call it K radiation. And then it depends on where it comes from. If it comes from one shell above, for example, from the L shell, then we call it K alpha. And depending on the subshells, we add an, another index, K alpha 1 or K alpha 2, and it jumps from, uh, from the next higher, from the M shell down to the K shell, we call it a K beta transition. So that's the naming scheme we use for this. And since all these tra transitions are very well defined, we also get a set of very well defined radiations on top of the Bremsstrahlung. So the typical spectrum we get from, a, from an X-ray tube looks something like this. We have the diffuse, the continuous uh, background of Bremsstrahlung, and on top of that we have these very well-defined characteristic emission lines. And uh, because these, the wavelength of these lines is specific or characteristic for a certain element, we call this the characteristic radiation. And here you can see the, the positions of the copper K alpha, K, K alpha 1, K alpha 2, K beta lines. And I can also show for another element from molybdenum the same lines. So they, they will be at a different wavelength. And we can choose the target material of our tube based on where we want our wavelength to be located. So these are almost monochromatic emission lines. And these are, this is what we need for XRD. So by choosing the target material, molybdenum or copper, we can decide which wavelength we would like to use for XRD. So to summarize this, it's really just a crash course on generation of X-rays. We use a cathode ray tube or an X-ray tube for, to, uh, to generate uh, X-rays in our lab. There are other possibilities like synchrotron facilities, but that's uh, on a different scale. So in the lab, we use these tubes. 
the spectrum always contains a continuous uh, contribution of Bremsstrahlung and on top of that a set of characteristic emission lines. Typically we see K alpha 1, K alpha 2, K beta and then there's more emission lines but they are usually much weaker than that. So when we buy a tube it is characterized first of all by the target material which defines the wavelength. It's also defined by the size and shape of the target. We can buy a line focus, a point focus tube, so depending on how big the target and in which orientation the target is. And then how we operate it by the acceleration voltage and the filament current. This is something we, we decide when, when we operate the instrument. So now that we can generate X-rays, we want to shoot a beam at our sample and do something with it. And then the question is, what happens when the X-rays interact with solid matter? And one aspect, one phenomenon we will observe is absorption. So what happens is th there is our X-ray beam arriving at the sample. It interacts with, with the, the, the electrons of, of the sample material and the X-ray will, will be absorbed and there will be an energy transfer to the electrons and it will heat up the sample a little bit. It's not much, it's just, just a little bit on a lab instrument. So it's a complete energy transfer to the sample. Another effect that will occur is the photoelectric effect. What happens is that the energy is again transferred to the electrons of the sample and now something familiar happens. If the energy transfer is en large enough, it may kick out this electron from its orbital. That's exactly what happened before from the, e from the electron beam. And now we end up with the same unstable situation of a vacancy on an inner shell that is compensated or relaxed by an outer electron falling back to the inner shell to fill the vacancy. And again, it will release characteristic radiation. It's exactly the same effect as what we saw before, with the only difference that the, the primary um, beam here is, is an X-ray beam and before that it was an electron beam. But again, we get the characteristic radiation for the element the beam is interacting with. And the third effect is called elastic scattering. What happens here is that the electrons start to oscillate in the electromagnetic field of the, of the incoming radiation. So it vibrates. And again, when an electron is forced to change its direction, it will emit X-rays with a certain frequency. And um, what we see here is a secondary uh, X-ray beam emitted by this electron that is vibrating. And because the, um, the frequency of the oscillation is given by the incoming radiation, the outgoing radiation, the secondary beam, will have the same frequency, and thus the same wavelength as the primary beam. And all three phenomena are useful for material scientists. The absorption is analyzed in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, like EXAFTS or ZANES, for example. The fluorescent radiation from the photoelectric effect is analyzed by X-ray fluorescence. It tells us what elements are in the sample by analyzing the characteristic radiation for these elements. And X-ray diffraction is based on elastic scattering. So this is what we are interested in, the elastic scattering. And it is important that there is, it's the same wavelength as the incoming radiation and there's also a phase relationship between the primary and the secondary radiation. That's important to get a clear, distinct interference pattern. So in a crystal structure, by definition, a crystal structure is a periodic arrangement of ions, atoms or molecules in three dimensions. So here that's just two dimensions, but it's a an example for a hypothetical crystal. So now if we irradiate this crystal with X-rays, each atom will become a source of secondary radiation with the same wavelength as the incoming radiation. And all these 
spherical waves that are emitted, more or less undirected, not completely undirected, but more or less in a random direction, they will overlap and we will start to see an interference of these different uh, secondary waves. So what does it mean? If we have just one source, unfortunately it's a bit cut off at the bottom of the screen, so there's one dot, one source of a spherical wave that's emitted undirected in all, in all directions, we will just see the sine wave going everywhere at the same intensity. As soon as we add a second source in a close proximity, roughly one wavelength apart from this first source, we will start to see the interference pattern of the two emitted waves. And obviously we get directions uh, with an amplification, with a strong amplitude of the resulting wave and other directions with no amplitude, so extinction. And I already mentioned it, what happens here in the green directions, um, the, the waves are aligned so that they overlap in a, in a positive manner, the amplitudes add up and we get a stronger amplitude as a result. That's positive or con constructive interference and in the red directions they are phase shifted so the amplitudes cancel out and we get destructive or negative interference. When we add more sources, instead of just these two, now we can see them at the bottom of the screen, if we add more, the pattern changes as follows. So these are four sources, eight in a row, now it's cut off again, 12, 25 and 50 sources. So now if you would see it at the bottom of the screen, it would be like a, like a pearl necklace, just 50 dots in a row in the same distance, emitting the same kind of spherical or here circular wave. And what, what remains is one direction with positive interference and in all other directions, there's destructive interference. So the, the secondary waves cancel out. Um, if we would change the, the phase from one dot, from one point source to the other, what would happen is that the, this, the direction of this beam would change. So it would bend either to the right or to the left. That's what the phase would contribute to this pattern. Now this is only a one-dimensional crystal. And now at this point we will skip a whole lot of mathematics and immediately <laughs> Uh, jump to, to the simplified version of what happens in a three-dimensional crystal. And you may have heard this before, it's described by Bragg's law. And it's much more complex uh, if we have to take into account the three-dimensional grid or, uh, of the crystal structure. And in most cases, the secondary radiation will just cancel out. There will be no no diffraction signal, with a few exceptions. And these exceptions are described by Bragg's law. So if the, the primary wavelength is given, that would be lambda, and the distance uh, between the, the, um, the, the planes in the crystal structure, the lattice planes, is d. And if this equation, n times lambda, is equals 2d sinus theta, if this is fulfilled, we will see a diffraction signal, the diffracted beam. If this is not fulfilled, we see nothing. It's just cancelled by the interference phenomenon. So in a crystal structure, again, this is a two-dimensional one, but it will be the same in a three-dimensional crystal. We see a lot of different lattice planes. With, uh, we use the Miller indices to label them, and they have different D distances. So each of them will generate a diffraction signal if the Bragg equation is fulfilled. So for a single crystal, this means that we have to bring, to rotate the crystal and bring it in diffraction condition. So usually when we put a single crystal in an X-ray beam, probably we, there's a high chance of not, we, we will not see anything. But if we rotate it, as soon as a certain set of diffraction planes fulfills the Bragg's equation, we will see this diffracted beam pop up. 
So we rotate it to bring as many lattice planes in diffraction condition to fulfill the Bragg's equation as possible. In a powder, this is a bit different. In a powder, if, if, if the orientation of the crystals is random, we can assume that every possible orientation of crystals occurs at all time. That would be a perfectly randomized powder. So we don't have to move the sample. We can just hold it in the beam and immediately all possible uh, diffraction signals will show up. And um, when I say that the diffracted beam leaves the primary beam at a certain angle, 2 theta we call it, then it can still be in different directions. So what I'm showing here, if the primary beam goes to the sample and continues after the sample, all beams that leave the, the primary beam at a specific angle, for example, the angle for this 1, 2, 0 um, lattice plane, they form a cone. So all beams on this cone leave the primary beam at the same angle, just in different directions. Same for the 1, 0, 0 and the 0, 1, 0 beam, just at different 2 theta angles. So what we actually get from a powder sample is this pattern of, of concentric um, diffraction cones. And what we do on the X-ray diffractometer is we scan through these cones and record the intensities as a function of the angle between the primary beam and the position of the detector. So usually this works like this. We move the tube and the detector on a circle to scan around the sample and we record the intensities as we go along. And in, the Bra in Bragg's equation, we use theta as the diffraction angle. That's the, the, the angle between the, the beams and the lattice plane. But because we don't see the lattice planes, we only see the primary beam and the secondary beam, we use twice the theta angle, so two theta, uh, as the unit of the x-axis, because that's how we position the, the tube and the detector. One important aspect of this diffraction phenomenon is that if we take a close look at Bragg's equation, again, we see that if we change lambda, the wavelength, but we keep the d value, the lattice plane spacing constant, the diffraction angle will change. So what this means is that if we start with a polychromatic beam with different lambda wavelength, the diffraction phenomenon will act, will, will basically split up the different wavelengths and diffract them at different angles. Different lambdas lead to different diffraction angles from the same lattice plane with a spacing D. So basically it acts like an optical prism, which also um, separates the um, different wavelengths of a white beam into different uh, refraction angles. And what this means, if we go back to our radiation spectrum, we, we don't have monochromatic radiation. We have this Brennstrahlung, very diffuse, but also not very high in intensity. But then also this set of three very well-defined, almost or nearly monochromatic emission lines, K-alpha-1, K-alpha-2 and K-beta. These are different wavelengths, so they will diffract at different angles. And this is also what we see in the diffraction pattern from just one lattice plane set. Here in this example, it's the 0, 1, 4 lattice planes of corundum, yeah. alumina oxide, aluminum oxide. Um, we see all these additional peaks. So not just one diffraction peak, al although we just had one narrow beam diffracting with the, with the sample, but we see K-alpha-1 diffracting at a different angle than K-alpha-2, K-beta, and also some additional contamination lines from my tube because it's getting a bit old and it's showing some tungsten uh, uh, tungsten uh, emission lines also uh, with different wavelengths and they diffract at, at different angles. <laughs>
So if we don't use any filters, that's the signal we would get. We would like to have only one peak, ideally, because then our diffraction pattern would be much simpler. But we, because we don't use strictly monochromatic radiation, we get this whole set of peaks for every lattice plane spacing. We can do something about that for almost all these cont contamination peaks if we use a filter to filter mostly k-beta. And in this case, I also used an uh, energy dispersive detector that can filter anything outside of the, of the window I can define in the detector. Then what's left is k-alpha 2 and k-alpha 1. But these two wavelengths are so nearby that I, on my instrument, I have no, uh, no possibility to filter k alpha 2. There are uh, optical elements, primary beam monochromators, that are capable of even filtering k alpha 2, but usually they come with a loss of k alpha 1 intensity as well. So it's always a trade off. Do you live with two peaks, or but more intensity, or do you filter the second peak, but you get less intensity of the K alpha one peak as well. So now we know how what, what happens on the X-ray diffractometer. And I want to talk a little bit about common instrument configurations. There are different possibilities how we can set up the instrument um, for different applications. And we, we have to know what kind of instrument configuration we are using. And we, we should ideally make a, um, an educated decision which instrument we use for different applications. And I want to go quickly through, through how these different configurations work and what they are uh, used for and for what applications we should choose which configuration. So. We distinguish, in general, between two different setups, uh, either the transmission geometry or the re reflective geometry. Transmission means that the sample material is either held in a glass capillary of less than a millimeter diameter, typically 0 0.5, 0 0.3 millimeters in diameter. So it's very small. Or we can also use foils or fluid cells but the important aspect is that the radiation has to travel through the sample. So that's why we call it transmission geometry. And these are ideal for light materials, organic materials, for example, polymers or pharmaceuticals, because these materials don't absorb a lot of radiation. So we still get a strong signal on the other end, uh, uh, reaching the detector. Also, if we only have very small amounts of material, of course, uh, we, we can use less than 100 milligrams, much less, probably around 10 milligrams of material. So whenever we have a limited amount of material, this is one option. Also hazardous materials, because we can prepare the, the capillary in a controlled environment, seal it, and then minimize exposure to the operator. Or air sensitive materials also prepare the capillary in a controlled atmosphere, seal it, and, and it's, it doesn't react on the instrument. In this case, we also should choose which kind of radiation we, we use. Uh, typically, we, we don't want much of the radiation to be absorbed by the sample, because we would just get less intensity on, on, at the detector. So we would use something with a short wavelength, harder radiation, like molybdenum K-alpha radiation, which is much, it's about half the wavelength of copper or, or uh, cobalt or chromium radiation, and is absorbed much, much less by the sample than the longer wavelength radiation. So this would be ideal for transmission geometry instruments. On the other hand, reflective geometry is what we typically use for highly absorbing materials, ceramics, metals, minerals. Um, in this case, we get a diffraction signal from the surface layers. So the surface maybe a few micrometers, 100 micrometers of the, at the surface of the sample, and the radiation doesn't travel through the material. So it doesn't really matter that the material absorbs a lot, we still get a good signal from the surface. Also, because we have a defined orientation of the sample, uh, 
It's not randomly tumbling in the, in the capillary. It's a defined orientation. We can also use this for thin films and texture analysis where we, we want to correlate the signal to the orientation of the sample on the instrument. And in this case, we don't want to use hard radiation that is not absorbed a lot because that would mean that the radiation penetrates into the sample and uh, we would get a more blurry signal. The deeper it penetrates into the this, this sample, the blurrier the signal uh, we get. So we want something that is quickly absorbed and only interacts with the surface layers of the sample and then we get a, a focused and high resolution diffraction pattern. So I will focus on the reflective geometry. Uh, I don't know what materials you guys are working with. Um, for me, it's, it's the, there are some reasons I will explain later why the flat reflective geometry configuration is, the, is usually preferred for reed felt refinement. And if we take a closer look at at this setup, this is a very simple configuration, just the tube, the sample and the detector. And you can see that we use a divergent beam. So the beam coming from a point source more or less, so a very small source, the target in the tube. And then we use a divergent beam to irradiate a large area on the sample. And this may sound a bit counterintuitive at first, but on the diffracted side, on the secondary beam side, the this configuration has the advantage that the secondary beams are convergent. So they meet again in a focus point. And this is where we place the detector. And the reason why we like this, uh, con uh, this configuration so much is that um, we get a high intensity because we can use a divergent beam, so a relatively large area of the generated X-rays and we can irradiate a large area on the sample and we still get a very focused signal if we place the detector correctly. So we get a high resolution, high intensity and high resolution. And this is the reason why we like this brack Brentano parafocusing geometry. It's called parafocusing because it's not a true focus. Um, to truly focus in one point, the sample surface would have to be bent with the radius of the focusing circle. But we use a flat, a flat sample, so it's almost a focus, but not quite a focus. That's why we call it parafocusing geometry. And it has the advantage of giving us because a high intensity and high resolution signal at the same time. On the instrument, we use a lot of optical elements, apertures, to control the shape of the beam. And usually we don't change too much with this configuration. I'm just listing all the options we have on a typical Bragg Brentano parafocusing instrument. Um, there are divergent slits, solid slits, and the anti scatter slits block uh, air scattering. There's a beam mask to shape the beam. On the secondary side, we block again air scattering radiation to improve the the resolution and reduce the background of, of the signal. And other solar slits are used to block divergent beams that go in different directions. So we only get parallel beams and so on. So usually if we have a good setup, we don't change too much to this. But I want to focus specifically on the divergent slit because this one is a bit more important in my opinion. It's the slit that controls the divergence angle of the primary beam. And it is important that we do not illuminate our sample holder. So we have to change to, to, to match the, the divergence angle when, that when the instrument is in the starting position at the lowest angles, we do not hit the sample holder. We only illuminate the sample area. So at the low incident angle, we have to close the divergent slit so much that we don't hit the sample holder because we would get a signal from the sample holder depending on what it's made of. If it's alumina, we would, or so elox, uh, some, some oxidized alum aluminum at the surface, we would get such a signal and we don't want that. If it's polymer, we would get a fancy background 
from the polymer and we don't want that either. So keep the beam on the sample area. And then as we move towards higher angles, if we don't change this divergence angle, we will, we will illuminate a shorter uh, length on the sample. But because of the steeper incident angle, we will penetrate deeper into the sample. So as a result, we will get the same interaction volume of the, so the same volume of the beam interacting with the sample throughout the measurement from start to end, which is okay. We can live with that. But there's another option. We can again start at the same condition. And as we move towards higher angle, we can open up the slit, the divergence angle, to irradiate the, the same maximized area on the sample. So by opening up the, the slit, as we move towards higher angles, we can increase the volume of interaction between the sample and, and the radiation. And for this, we need a motorized divergence slit that is capable of opening up during the scan towards higher angles. And in that case, the irradiated area on the sample is constant, but due to the deeper penetration, we get a larger uh, interaction volume. And the, the difference can be seen here in these two scans of the same sample, once with a fixed and once with a, once with a variable divergence slip. At the beginning, they look fairly similar, but if we look at the end of, of the scan, the variable slit gives us probably more than twice the intensity at close to 90 degrees. So this is something we should match to, to our sample and we should decide which mode we prefer to use. So what we should do, or not, what we should not do, <laughs> rather, um, we should by all means avoid beam overflow also at the beginning of the scan at very low angles, because this would give us the contamination signals and it would also mess up the intensity because part of the radiation would not interact with the sample but with the sample holder. So it would mess up our intensities at low angles. Don't do that. But on the other hand, don't be too conservative and reduce the area of illumination too much because it would work, but it's uh, we, we are just sacrificing a lot of intensity. We could get a lot more intensity by choosing optimum slit settings. So what you should do is make sure the primary beam illuminates the largest, largest possible area on the sample without hitting the sample holder. Then we get a nice intensity without any contamination signals. So to come back to the entire beam path, starting at the tube, going through all the primary beam or incident beam apertures to the sample and then the secondary beam optics to the detector. This is a kind of a checklist I'm, I like to use for myself. You may prefer something else, but this is what I use. So the divergence slit, I usually prefer the automatic setting because it's, uh, it gives me more intensity at high angles. And I try to maximize the irradiated area. Then the next element is the solar slit, or it's also called collimator. Most instruments come with two different ones, so you can just choose a narrow or a wide one. And I prefer to use the, the narrow one, the small opening. Um, it gives me a bit better angular resolution, especially at low peaks. At low angles, the, the peak shape will be a bit more symmetric, but again, at the cost of, of uh, intensity. Then some instruments have a beam mask that controls the width of the beam. My instrument doesn't, but if you have one, also make sure that uh, your beam doesn't hit the sample holder, but otherwise use it as wide as possible. Then there is an anti-scatter slit that it should only block air scattered radiation. So it should not really block the, the primary beam. So usually I set it to the same value as the divergence slit. So it really doesn't, it's just a second divergence slit that blocks any additional scattered radiation. The sample itself, I, I let it spin around the a vertical axis 
we will talk about this later on, why this can be important. And then on the secondary beam path, diffracted beam path, it's basically the same um, anti-scatter slit I set to wide open, so it doesn't block my detector. It's a linear detector. Solar slit I use the same as on the primary beam side. I have some additional slots for potential filters and slits. They are empty, I'm not using them. But I'm using a K-beta filter, because even though I have an a, a energy dispersive detector, it's not sufficient to suppress K-beta entirely. So I use an additional K-beta foil, filter foil, the nickel filter in the beam path. And then the linear detector I'm using, I use it at the maximum opening to get the best intensity. So this is just something you can go through your instrument from the left to the right and check that all the settings, all the apertures make sense for your specific application. This is just my preference, but um, that's what you should do to make sure that you are using a good configuration. Again, a summary of different um, instrument configurations. As I already mentioned, this simple and very common Brack Brentano parafocusing geometry is really what we should use for reed felt refinement. So when we do uh, phase analysis, uh, phase quantifications, or structure refinements, because of the high intensity, the high resolution, and also the more particles are contributing to the pattern, the smoother our diffraction signal will be, so we have the best particle statistics. On the downside, it, we need a lot of material, typically around one gram for ceramics or minerals, to fill the sample holder, which is not always available, but that, that would be the only downside I, I can think of for most applications. Some users use a, a parallel beam geometry that's almost the same, except that there is a, a focusing mirror in the primary beam that turns the divergent beam into a parallel beam. And it sounds very tempting because it focuses the beam on a smaller spot, but for most applications this is not good because it's no longer parafocusing. You can see on the secondary beam side at the detector, it's still parallel. So we get a much more diffuse signal from this, even though we can focus the beam on the sample. So for general retrial refinement, it's usually not preferred. There are other applications that require a parallel beam, for example, a grazing incident angle XRD, which is a surface layer characterization technique. So that one works better with a focusing mirror, but for just phase analysis, structure analysis, it's usually a worse choice than the very simple parafocusing geometry. Also, the, the mirror may be helpful for, for capillary setups, because it, we have a problem with a divergent beam. If we, if we use a divergent beam for capillary setups, that the capillary is so small that hardly any ra radiation actually hits the capillary. So we get a very, very low intensity, unless we use a focusing mirror and focus more radiation on the capillary. And then, because the capillary is so thin, the, the secondary beam is also, even though it's parallel, it's also fairly thin, and we still get a reasonable resolution. So this is what what I usually recommend, unless you have a good reason to use something else. In past Profex workshops, I went into a lot more detail on the different effects when we when we change the settings of of the solar slits and the and the anti scatter slits and whatnot. And these slides, so you can see on some examples, there there's always a comparison, like here, what the effect of certain changes to the optical configuration actually do in the diffraction pattern. So I thought it would be a bit too much for this course, so I, I did not include that many details. But the slides are still available. If you go to the Profex website on the page Lecture Handouts, for example, I could recommend the one from 2017, Lesson 2, Diffractometers. That's what I showed on the previous slide. 
And then if you want to know more, does it really help if I change whatever the, the, the solid slits, how, how does it affect the resolution? You will see examples on these old slides.